Minecraft 1 and 19.4 contains a huge amount of goodies for map makers, which I'll have a separate video about, but also several new gameplay features and lots of news in the Update 120 Experiment Pack. My name is Slice Slime, come with me on a guide through all these new changes. Let's start with some updates to blocks and items. Jukeboxes now display note particles above when they are playing a music disc. They now also emit a redstone signal at level 15, which ends when the disc has finished playing. Hoppers and droppers can now also interact with the jukebox, so you can automate playing discs and taking them back out. Since the jukebox emits power when it's playing, a hopper beneath it remains locked, but a hopper minecart can be used to take out discs even while playing. Fire chargers are now available in the Creative Inventory Ingredients tab. Another thing that has been added to the Creative Inventory is all the different paintings. Of course, you can still get the regular, any old painting item, but you can now also get each individual painting. If you have such a painting with a predetermined variant, the artist and name of that painting will now show up if you hover over it in the inventory. If you have the Operator Permissions and the Operator Items tab option on, you can also grab the Four Elements paintings variants that are not available in survival mode from there. A bug has been fixed that you may have seen in a recent beta release of the Fetcher Bingo map, when far away from the origin of the world, mined blocks would pop out in the wrong place. That is now fixed. Let's move on to mob changes. Horse breeding has been tweaked, so babies are more likely to be better or worse rather than average. This makes it a more viable gameplay strategy to selectively breed horses to get a really good horse, given enough time and a large enough supply of golden carrots. Some notable bug fixes. A problem with the villager AI has been fixed, which could cause them to freeze entirely in place. Opening a hopper minecart no longer provokes piglins. LAs are now much quicker at following a player. Sitting cats that get pushed into water no longer drown. And Endermen can once again take damage from end crystal TNT and wither skull explosions, which should fix some broken wither rose farm designs out there. In gameplay news. A feature that existed in very old versions and in single player only was that when taking damage, the camera wobble would depend on the direction of incoming damage. That is now also the case in this version, both in single player and multiplayer. You can now replace armor by using an armor piece held in your hand, even if that slot was already occupied by another piece of armor. Armor stands with custom names will now keep those names when placed in the world and then broken again. Some notable gameplay bug fixes. Fire charges are now consumed when used to ignite creepers in survival or adventure mode. Blast protection now protects against explosion knockback. And a bug with hopper minecarts failing to pick up items out of piles of mixed things has also been fixed. Skulk sensors now trigger in an array of new situations they wouldn't before. In visual news, the enchantment glint is now different between UI items and worn items, and is more pronounced in the UI. A new glint strength option default is now 75%, with the overall effect that the glint is less overpowering, making it easier to see the armor underneath. Potion items are no longer covered by enchantment glints, and the colors of almost all potions have been changed to make it easier to distinguish between different potions. Some visual bug fixes of note. A sea fighting glitch on leggings worn by entities have been fixed, and the guardian beams now render in worlds that have been around for a long time. Drowned now have a separate animation when moving underwater, and the magma cube shadows now match their size. In the user interface news, this version has a brand new screen for the create new world options. When you first open the screen, it now has the most important options up front, world name, game mode, and difficulty. The rest of the options are now organized into several tabs. The World tab has the World Type, Seed, and options for the World Generation. The More tab contains more advanced options like Experimental Settings, Data Packs, and Game Rules. Menu screens can now be navigated using the arrow keys as an alternative to the Tab key navigation. When doing this, sliders need to be activated using the Enter or Space buttons before they can be moved. And text that is too long for its buttons will now scroll back and forth within that button instead of continuing out the sides. There are quite a few new options and accessibility improvements in this version. There's a new welcome screen the first time the game is started. Press enter to enable the narrator. This screen lets you turn on the narrator and provides immediate access to the accessibility settings. A new high contrast accessibility mode toggle has been added. You can turn it on from the accessibility options screen or enable the resource pack on the resource packs selection screen. 
The pack changes the user interface in the game to a high contrast look while leaving the gameplay elements unchanged. There's also a new option called Notification Time, which controls how long the Toast notification pop-ups stay on screen. And there are two new options available on both the Accessibility screen and the Video Options screen, controlling the speed and transparency of the enchantment glint. There's also an Accessibility option called Damage Tilt Strength. The default is 100% and you can slide that down to reduce the strength of the tilt all the way to entirely off. The Keybind screen now shows clearly which keys have conflicts and has a new tooltip for conflicting keybinds that tells you which keys they are in conflict with. And the Auto Jump option is now off by default. A couple of new game rules have been added in this version. One of note for regular gameplay is called Do Vines Spread. The default value is true and turning this off means classical vines no longer spread to nearby blocks. This has no effect on cave vines or the nether type of vines. This version also has massively optimized start time for the game, as well as several crash fixes and other stability fixes. There are also many new things and updates for the experimental content for update 120, the Trails and Tales update. The rest of this video is going to showcase things that are only available when the update 120 pack is enabled, which you can now also do by going to the new experiment screen in the more tab of the create new world screen. The smithing table has been changed. You now have three input slots instead of two, the first one being for a new item called a smithing template. These templates can be found in structures all over the world. To upgrade a diamond piece to netherite, you need a netherite upgrade smithing template, which can be found in some bastion remnant chests, with one being guaranteed in a treasure room bastion chest. A number of other new smithing templates have been added. Each one of these is a pattern for adding a trim to an armor piece. A trim pattern, an armor piece and a metal ingot or crystal item combine into a pattern on the armor depending on the smithing template used and a color depending on the mineral used. When placing these items in the smithing table you can also see a preview on an armor stand on how the resulting item will look. The icon for the trimmed armor is always the same regardless of which pattern was used. These trims are purely there to make you look absolutely fabulous, they offer no change to gameplay. Hovering your cursor over a trimmed item in the inventory will show you what pattern and material was used. You can use a wide range of materials to apply the trim to your armor pieces. The available colors are iron, copper, gold, lapis, emerald, diamond, netherite, redstone, amethyst and quartz. If you use the same trim material as the armor you're applying the trim to, you'll get a slightly darker color for the pattern. Armor trims can also be applied to leather armor. This means you can also combine dyed leather armor with all colors of armor trims. Very colorful. When you craft the armor trim onto the armor, all the inputs are consumed. However, you can also duplicate the templates before using them. That is done in a crafting table by placing the template seven diamonds and a stone of the base type for that template. This gives you back two smithing templates. There are 11 different armor trim smithing templates. The different patterns are unique per structure, so you'll need to loot a number of different places to get all the possible patterns. Also, the chances of getting these aren't uniform, so some will be harder to get than others. The sentry armor trim is found in pillager outposts. To duplicate this one, you'll need a cobblestone. The Dune armor trim is found in desert pyramids. To duplicate it, you'll need a sandstone. The Coast armor trim is found in shipwrecks. You'll want a cobblestone to duplicate this one. Jungle temple chests can have the Wild armor trim, which is then duplicated using mossy cobble. The Tide Armor Trim is found in Ocean Monument. But Lime, those don't have chests, you say. Don't you worry, the pattern has a 20% chance of dropping as loot from an Elder Guardian. You'll need Prismarine to duplicate it. The Ward Armor Trim is found in Ancient Cities. That is duplicated using Deep Slate. Woodland Mansions contain the Vex Armor Trim, which is duplicated using Cobblestone.
Time to check out the Nether! You can find the Rib Armor Trim as a Nether Fortress loot, and duplicate it using Netherrack. Bastion Remnants can have the Snout Armor Trim, which is duplicated using Blackstone. As I mentioned before, they can also have the Netherite Upgrade Smithing Template, which is duplicated using Netherrack. Strongholds can have the Eye Armor Trim, that is duplicated using Endstone. And finally, the Spire Armor Trim is found in End Cities and is duplicated using Purper Blocks. One last thing before we move on from the trims. Having gold trims on your armor is not fancy enough to pacify piglins. Hey, if you're enjoying this video this far, please trim a like pattern onto the video. These update videos take an immense amount of effort to make, and leaving a like it really helps out the video and the channel, so thank you. I appreciate it. Let's move on to archaeology! The brush is a new tool crafted from a feather, a copper ingot, and a stick in a vertical line. It is used by using the interact or use button by default right click rather than by punching with it. The brush is used on a new block called Suspicious Sand. You can find that in desert temples and the desert wells. It looks suspiciously much like sand, but with some suspicious darkest splotches on it. Suspicious. When you use a brush on a suspicious sand, it will go through four different stages of becoming darker and more broken looking, while an item slowly appears out of the surface you brush. After this process is done, the block turns to regular sand and the item pops out. If you instead mine a suspicious sand, it vanishes into nothing. It also does fall like regular sand, but when it lands, it will also vanish. So what do you get when you brush it? That depends on the structure you found the block in. In wells, you can find a new item called an arms up pottery shard, a brick, an emerald, a stick, or a suspicious stew of the same types as you can find in shipwrecks. You're three times as likely to get a pottery shard as any of the other items. In desert pyramids, you can find an archer, prize, or a skull pottery shard, gunpowder, a TNT block, a diamond, or an emerald, with all items equally likely. Brushing any other block than suspicious sand does nothing. There's also a new item called a decorated pot, which is crafted from four bricks. You can also switch any of the bricks out for a pottery shard, which replaces that side with a decorated piece depending on the shard you used. The block is directional, so the same design can be turned in any direction. Sides made from bricks will be blank. Breaking a decorated pot with a silk touch tool gives you the pot, and so does breaking it with your fist or an item which is not a tool. Breaking it with any tool smashes it, giving you back the shards used to craft it. Speaking of ancient things, a first version of the Sniffer mob that won the latest mob vote makes its first appearance in this version. The Sniffer is a passive mob with 14 health, that is 7 hearts. He's a large boy, covering just shy of 2x2 full blocks. Currently, Sniffers do not spawn in the game and are only available through a red and green spawn egg in the creative inventory. Sniffers cannot be tempted or tamed, and they have a 10% chance of dropping a moss block when killed, which increases with looting. They lumber around, sniffing in the air, and sometimes they will also dig for seeds. This makes a new item pop out called a torch flower seed. This seed can in turn be used to breed sniffers, and baby sniffers also eat them, making them grow up slightly faster. You can also plant the torch flower seeds in farmland, like other seeds. This plants a torch flower crop, which grows through an intermediate stage before becoming a fully grown torch flower. Harvesting the crop when in the first two stages gives you back the seeds. Harvesting the fully grown flower gives you the flower itself. It can then be planted on dirt-like blocks like other flowers, placed in flower pots, or crafted into orange dye. Torch flowers can also be used as an ingredient for suspicious stews, which gives a night vision effect. Its name is a lie, by the way. The torch flower does not light up its environment. Speaking of flowery things, let's look at the last big feature of this version. The Cherry Grove Biome. This is a new mountain biome that can be found in similar locations as the meadows. It is covered in cherry trees with bright pink leaves and a new type of logs, cherry logs. These tree trunks fork or bend high up and are then covered in large, round canopies of cherry leaves. 
Cherry logs come with a new wood set, including logs and strip logs, wood and stripped wood, planks, stairs, slabs, fences and fence gates, doors and trap doors, buttons, pressure plates, signs and hanging signs, and boats and chest boats. Cherry leaves have pink particles falling underneath, and on the ground on the cherry grove you can find a new type of vegetation. Pink petals. In addition to finding the pink petals on the ground, you can also obtain them by bone mealing the block, or by bone mealing a grass block in the cherry grove biome. Each block can contain up to four petals. When broken, you get back as many petals as there are in the block. These can be placed in any orientation on top of a block, and placing more than one into the same block increases the amount of petals in it, which also happens if you apply bone meal to it. You can also craft the petals into pink dye. Cherry saplings are planted and grown like most other saplings, and can also be placed in flower pots. And that is the end of the new things in the Update 120 Experimental Pack and for Minecraft 1.19.4. Thank you very much for watching, my name is Slime, and I'll see you next time.